Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing DraftKings stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. DraftKings is a website or app you go to to gamble on sports. You could bet on baseball, basketball, football, and hockey. But there's so many more sports you can gamble on, like golf, NASCAR, MMA, tennis, and lots more. The site also hosts fantasy sports leagues. It has a 33% market share in the U.S. online sports betting industry. Also, according to the company, it controls 17% of the U.S. revenue in the iGaming industry. In the third quarter of 2021, it had 1.3 million users who spent an average of $47. It makes money through fees, advertising, and partnerships with other companies in the sports industry. When I say fees, I mean they take a percentage of what people gamble on sports or in tournaments. This is known as a VIG. Let's say, for example, the Yankees are playing the Blue Jays. If one person bets $100 on the Yankees, another person bets $100 on the Blue Jays, then the bookie is guaranteed to make money. Because say the Yankees win, the person who bet on the Yankees gets $100, but the person who bets on the Red Sox loses $100 plus a 10% VIG. So the person who loses pays $110. That's how a traditional bookie makes money, but a company like this makes money from so many other different sources. DraftKings was funded by a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company is formed to raise money through an IPO, then acquire a private business to help them go public. This is also known as a reverse merger or reverse takeover. The SPAC that acquired them was Diamond Eagle. The company is headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts and was founded in 2012. The ticker trades on the NASDAQ, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Sao Paulo, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 8.9 billion market cap. They're trading at $22 a share and they have 407 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So the company is still cash flow negative every single year and it seems to be getting worse. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's also negative each year and getting worse. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that's been growing a ton from 226 million to 1.1 billion. So their revenue growth is amazing. So this company is sacrificing profits to grow its revenue. And when that recipe works, it works really well. But when it doesn't work, then there's no coming back. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Cost of labor and the cost to maintain their website and apps are part of cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that looks really good growing from 180 million to 444 million. Below that is their operating expenses. Marketing is their main operating expense, and below that is their operating income, which is negative every year and getting worse. They do have a lot of cash on hand, so they generate more interest on their investments than they pay on their debt. So you can see their net interest was positive 2.3 million, and that 2.3 million equals the interest they received on their investments minus the interest they pay on their debt. Then you have your pre-tax income, they don't really pay much in taxes because they're not really making any money at this point. Then you have earnings from equity interest. These are their earnings from investments in other companies. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which is negative every year. This is the company's income statement from their latest quarterly report. The first nine months of 2020, the first nine months of 2021, the third quarter of 2020, and the third quarter of 2021. Their revenue grew from 133 million to 213 million. But their growth in the first nine months of the year is phenomenal, 300 million to 800 million. Of the 213 million of revenue, 176 million is from online gaming. If you placed any bets with DraftKings, your revenue goes into this bucket. Gaming software of 24 million, this is the software they license to casinos. And that has decreased. It was 29 million, now it's 23 million. Their other revenue went up the most from 4 million to 13 million. 
According to their quarterly report, other revenues are primarily media and retail sports book. A bulk of their revenue is in the U.S., but they do have 25 million international. And it's really easy for this company to sell their product internationally because they don't have to manufacture anything. They just need approval from that country or maybe the state within the country to offer their services. And their business to customer revenue is 189 million. Business to business is 24 million. Business to business is a licensing of their software to casinos. Their cost of revenue is 171 million. Gross profit is revenue minus cost of revenue. So their gross margin is 20%. Gross margin is gross profit over revenue, which is a lot worse than their industry of 57%. They spent 300 million on marketing, that's up from 200 million. They spent 65 million in their technology and 220 million in GNA. This includes the cost and fees to maintain their website, also includes payroll. So they have an operating loss of 550 million. Last year was 350 million. This line right here is a gain or loss on the remeasurement of warrants. So depending how their stock price moves, they have to revalue the warrants. But this is a non-cash item. When the person who holds the warrant exercises it, then it becomes a cash item. In the third quarter of 2020, their average monthly unique payers was 1 million, and that grew about 30% to 1.3 million. Equally as relevant is how much money each user spends, and that grew a lot as well from $34 to $47. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses from its operational business. So you could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash, because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. And they spent over 60 million in the trailing 12 months in CapEx. This is mostly investments in their software infrastructure. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow and they have negative free cash flow each year. So they're running their business on stock and debt. They issued $140 million of stock in 2018, 2.3 billion in 2020, that's when they IPO'd, and 1 billion in the trailing 12 months. They did issue a lot of debt in the trailing 12 months, 1.3 billion. That's usually a bad sign when a company issues debt and has negative operating cash flow. Because when you have negative operating cash flow, you want to raise equity, not debt. Because when you raise debt, you have to pay the interest on your debt. And then you get into more debt. Or if you can't pay the interest payments, you're forced into bankruptcy. Debt is fine as long as you have enough cash flow coming in to pay the interest payments on that debt. This is the company's operating cash flows from their latest quarterly report. The first nine months of 2020, the first nine months of 2021. To calculate their operating cash flow, you start with their net loss, that was negative 1.2 billion. We have to add back depreciation and amortization. We have to add back half a billion of stock-based compensation. This is when a company pays employees with stock. It brings down their net income, but it's a non-cash item, so we add it back here. We also have to adjust for changes in working capital. It looks like they purchased $200 million of stuff on credit, so that's a cash inflow. But when they pay for those items, it'll be a cash outflow. And they had a cash inflow of $190 million from their users. Changes in working capital are more of a timing thing. So if a company had negative net income and positive operating cash flows because they took on a lot of accounts payable, I would not consider that a good thing. But if they had negative net income and positive operating cash flow because they had lots of non-cash items on the income statement, I would probably consider that a good thing. This is the investing and financing sections from the statement of cash flows, the first nine months of 2020 and the first nine months of 2021. They spent 11 million of property and equipment, 31 million of internally developed software. They spent 8 million in both the years in acquiring gaming licenses. In order to offer their services in a particular state, they need to get a license from that state because every state is separate. Last year, they spent 177 million in acquisitions. This year, 65 million. So in their investing section, they had a cash outflow of 118 million. Last year was a cash outflow of 211 million. In their financing section, they received 1.2 billion on convertible notes. This is when the holder of the note converts their debt to equity. And they do that when the stock price goes up. They had a cash outflow of 124 million from capped call options. This is just a call option that caps the upper and caps the lower limit of the price point. And they bought back 14 million of common stock. These two large amounts from last year are when they IPO'd. 
DEAC stands for Diamond Eagle Acquisition Corp. They're the SPAC that acquired this company. So in their financing section, they had a cash inflow of 1.1 billion. Last year was a cash inflow of 1.5 billion. This is the company's equity section on their 930 balance sheet. They have 1.8 billion of equity. They raised 5.5 billion from selling their business and they lost 3.4 billion from running their business. They also bought back 300 million of treasury stock. When a company buys common stock off the open market, they put it onto their balance sheet as treasury stock, and that decreases the shares outstanding. But treasury stock is a contra equity account, so it brings down your equity balance. Let's look at the capital structure, 1.8 billion of equity, 1.3 billion of debt. They're 58% equity, 42% debt. And they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have over $1 billion of cash left over. I gave them the lowest wax, 7.05% from Simply Wall Street, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated a little over three years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past 2024. That's $9.5 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $7.3 billion. We divide that by 407 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $18. They're trading at $22, so they're trading at a 21% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Their revenue is projected to grow 24.5% annually. So I grew it by that percentage for the next few years. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. The average company in their industry converts 18% of their revenue into free cash flow. So I multiply their 2024 revenue by 18%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. It seems pretty likely they'll be cash flow negative for at least two more years. So I gave them negative free cash flow in 22 and 23. The last time I did a video on this company was in January 2021. They were trading at $53 back then and I calculated their stock price at 34 and they've come down to 22 so they fell well below my $34 price target. The website simply Wall Street values the company at $63 and they're saying it's 66% undervalued. 18 analysts priced this stock and the average price target is 40, the lowest 23, the highest 65. This is where the stock has been trading since it IPO'd. Before the SPAC acquired DraftKings, it was trading at $10 a share like every other SPAC. But once they announced their acquisition target, then people start buying the stock. And I think they IPO'd in April. So you can see this was a rocket ship. It went past $70 just after a few months. But it seems like almost all SPACs out there come crashing down. They are trading above their $10 initial starting price. But there's so many SPACs trading below $2. There's a ton of trading activity. Look at these lines down here. If it's a red line, that means the sell orders are higher than the buy orders and the stock price goes down. If it's a green line, that means the buy orders are greater than the sell orders and the stock goes up. The higher the line, the more trading activity. They have a beta of two, so the stock is pretty volatile. It moves two times the market. It's gone down 65% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 15%. The 52 week low is 17, the high is 74. And the stock is on a major decline, trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. This is a really popular stock. At least 20 million shares are traded each day. In the past 10 days, over 34 million shares were traded each day. Of the 407 million shares outstanding, 354 million are on float. 64% are held by institutions. And it has a pretty high short percentage. Almost 12% of the shares on float are shorted. A bullish sign is seeing employee count go up. And they have been acquiring a lot of companies, so that does increase employee count. They're up to 2,600 as of the end of 2020. When they report their fourth quarter earnings in a couple of weeks, then we'll know their employee count at the end of 2021. If you put $10,000 into this company when it started as a SPAC, you'd be at $22,000 today. That's a return of 120%. But at one point, your investment would have been close to $80,000. In the past year, insiders have sold 24 million shares. And it's by lots of different people. Four individuals and 25 companies make up this 24 million. And 23 companies bought 21 million shares. And three individuals bought 67,000 shares. Two thirds of the shares are held by institutions, 20% by the general public, 8% by insiders, 5% by public companies, and a small amount by private companies and the state or government. Vanguard is the biggest shareholder at 6%. Then Kathy Wood's company, ARC, owns 5.2%. T. Rowe Price, Walt Disney. That's interesting to see Walt Disney here. 
and one of the directors of the company owns four and a half percent of the stock. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE since they have negative net income. Price of sales of 7.8, that's stock price of a sales per share. And price to book of 4.9, that's stock price of a book value per share. Let's look at their non-current assets. 45 million of property and equipment. 517 million of intangible assets. These could be patents or trademarks when they acquired another company. 626 million of goodwill. This is the premium you pay when you acquire another company. 68 million of operating leases. 5 million of equity investments. Generally, if you own between 20% and 50% of another company, you use equity method accounting. And 13 million of customer deposits. They have a high current ratio of 3.2, that's current assets over current liabilities. Let's look at their current assets, 2.4 billion of cash, half a million of cash reserved for users. Say 10 friends want to do a fantasy football league and they go through DraftKings. They all spend $100 each. So DraftKings keeps that $1,000 until the football season is over. Then they know how much to pay the winners of that league. 30 million of receivables reserved for users. 45 million of accounts receivables. This is how much money DraftKings owes other companies. And 35 million of prepaid expenses. DraftKings made an advance payment for a product or service they're gonna receive in the future. Let's look at their current liabilities. 417 million of accounts payable. This is how much money DraftKings owes other companies. It owes $500 million to its users and 13 million of operating lease liabilities. They had negative half a billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months and they have 2 billion of working capital. So it does seem like they have enough cash to get through the next 12 months without needing any debt or equity. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 16 companies in the same industry as DraftKings. And DraftKings spends more on CapEx than the average company. They're less leveraged than the average company. Of course, they don't pay a dividend yet since they have negative free cash flow. And they're the largest company on this list at close to 9 billion market cap. They do have a better price to book than the average company. Their price of sales is better than average. The only reason it's better is because this one company has such a bad price to sales ratio. DraftKings actually has a second worst ratio. Their revenue is higher than average at 1.1 billion, average is 816 million. But these three companies below them have a lower market cap with higher revenue. That's why their price to sales ratio is so much better. Price to sales is market cap over revenue. So looking at revenue and looking at market cap, looking at pretty much any number except these four ratios can be irrelevant because you really can't compare a $9 billion company with a $100 million company. That's why you use ratios like price to sales, price to book, price to earnings, because it equalizes the companies. And they are growing their revenue at an amazing pace. Their three year annual growth rate is 110%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 21% premium and I do really like their business model because there's so many people who like sports and like gambling. It's a thrill and a rush when you win. I used to gamble all the time on sports. I don't anymore, but I know there's huge demand. But they're bleeding so much cash and there's always obstacles. There's always seems to be somebody against them. And they don't really have a moat. Anybody can be in this industry if they build the software. Because if I pay 10% in fees to DraftKings for my bets, and another company open up and charge 9%, I would just go to that other company. And it just seems like SPACs are terrible investments. People have lost so much money on SPACs, so I generally would just stay away from all SPACs. I think you'll save a lot of money doing that. But the bright side is they are growing their revenue a ton, and if they could finally get to profitability, then things will be great. I'm sure the management of the company has identified a path to get to profitability. Now the hardest thing is the execution part. I rank their free cash flows 1 out of 10, their revenue 8 out of 10, and their ratio of 3 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.